So my name is Katherine Walker. I'm a visiting prof assistant professor in the Department of Psychology here at Union College, and I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. And my research and clinical work is in the areas of body image and eating disorders. And I'm here to talk to you today about how you can change the body image conversation. So I want you to close your eyes and imagine that you're a baby, <coughs> not even born yet. And you're lucky because your parents love you and they have the resources and the love to take care of you. They have so many hopes and dreams for you already. They're wondering whose eyes you'll have, whose ears you'll have, if you'll look like your Uncle John or your great grandma Betty. And now that you're starting to get a picture of some of the things that your parents are hoping and dreaming for you, you can open your eyes. So with their hopes and dreams come expectations. They want you to go to school, make friends. They want you to do well in school. They hope that you won't drink or do drugs or have sex, at least not until you're 30, maybe 35, <laughs> just to be safe. They want you to graduate from high school and get into a good college, maybe Union College. And they want you to graduate college and get a job that's stable, that you find fulfilling. And they want you to find love and get married and have children. So already, you're not even born yet. Your parents are already dreaming about your grandbabies. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> and it's not just their hopes and expectations that you are going to be experienced that are growing as you're growing your heart and your lungs and your 10 tiny fingers and your 10 tiny fingers and your 10 tiny toes. You probably have aunties and grandparents who are planning your baby shower and who are buying onesies that say things like, little girls are full of sugar and spice and everything nice, and I'm sassy like my mommy, and bows be before bros, <laughs> and move over Cinderella, there's a new princess in town, so these are some of the onesie slogans I found when I Googled it. And what are these things telling us? That girls should be sweet, sassy but not too sassy, that you should like pink and frills and bows, and that you should aspire to be a princess. And maybe your parents are trying to raise you with as few gender-based influences as possible, but likely some of those aunties and grandparents are buying you tea sets and are saying, oh, it's so sweet of you to share with Mr. Teddy Bear, and buying you dolls and saying, oh, Sally, you're doing so well taking care of your baby doll. You'll be such a good mommy someday. And even if you didn't have these experiences when you're a young child, pretty soon you're going to be going to school. And all those little boys and girls, they're going to pretty quickly teach you what you, cartoons you want to watch, what apps you need to have, what movies you need to like, to have friends and to be able to relate to them. And probably some of those things are Hello Kitty, Barbie dolls, Disney princesses, some of the makeup apps that they have today. And what are these things telling you? I'm not sure what message Hello Kitty is sending, other than she seems to exist to be cute. She doesn't have a mouth, so she's certainly not telling us about her opinions or desires or anything else, what kinds of things she likes. And if you look up Barbie doll um, on their website, Mattel's website has a quote from the founder saying, I created Barbie dolls to give little girls an idea of what careers they could have. And it shows this timeline from the original Barbie in 1959 through present day Barbie. And this timeline falls flat for me, and this message falls flat for me as well, because they have baby Dr. Barbie, who's wearing a mini skirt, which I would imagine would make it challenging to deliver babies. And I don't know how with her busy obstetrician schedule, she had time to do full makeup and hair. And I really have concerns about how well 1995's firefighter Barbie is doing pulling people out of fires wearing yellow stilettos. <laughs> and now think of your favorite Disney princess. And I'm going to try and guess some of her characteristics and traits for you. Does she have long, full, thick hair? Does she have big eyes and a big smile? Does she have a tiny waist, barely room for organs? <laughs> and she doesn't have much of a social life. Most of her friends are either birds, rodents, <laughs> comical sea creatures, singing, dancing, flat, flatware and dishes, talking snowman, caribou, or dwarves. 
And aside from those friends, she's aspiring to meet Prince Charming. And once they meet, they get married, they live happily ever after, and that's the end of her story. And the digital era is not much better. I uh, recently spent time with family, and my six-year-old niece, who's the most scrumptious human on the face of the planet, or one of them, was spending hours wrapped with her attention on an app that looked something like this, just changing out the color of the lipstick, the eyeshadow, the hair, and get, putting different jewelry on a mannequin-like face. And these kinds of apps, when I looked them up, one of them was listed as an educational app. And this is not the kind of education that I want for my niece or for our children more generally. And so perhaps as we get older, we realize that we're not going to find our Prince Charming. And even when we do find our Prince Charming, and mine's right here, hi honey. <laughs> <laughs> that we don't necessarily live happily ever after without working to create that happily ever after. Even when we're older and we realize these things, we are still re receiving these messages that we are valued for our appearance, from our peers and from our parents, often inadvertently. So you might hear your friends say something like, I can't believe she's wearing that, or I feel so fat today. And you might hear your parents tell you what you should or should not eat, or what you should or should not wear. Something like, honey, don't you think that skirt is a little short for you? Or, sweetie, I'm not so sure you should have that extra piece of cake. And these messages reinforce that we are valued for our appearance. And this is called fat talk or unhealthy appearance talk. And research finds that if we engage in fat talk, we are more likely to engage in disordered eating behaviors later. And if we engage in fat talk in front of our friends, we increase the likelihood that our friends will engage in fat talk. So if I'm engaging in fat talk with friends, I'm increasing the likelihood my friends will then engage in fat talk, which increases the likelihood that they will engage in disordered eating behaviors. And I would hazard a guess that many of you here today have done something like this in the past without realizing that link. And what this leads to is something that Rodin Silverstein and Striegelmoor coined normative discontent in 1984. And what that means is that body dissatisfaction is so common that it's called normative. And not much has changed since the 1980s for young women. And sadly, for young men, body dissatisfaction has become increasingly more common, increasingly more normative. And this normative discontent breeds eating disorders. So let's recap how we got here. Before you're born, you're already being put into a box. Your gender roles are already being constructed for you. And that box tells you how you should look, how you should act, and what you should aspire to be. And that's basically that you should be sweet, pretty, cute, eventually as you get older, sexy, and you should be nice and help take care of others. And as I mentioned, that normative discontent, it breeds eating disorders. So now you're all grown up. You're a Union College student. You are taking really interesting classes, maybe Evo Devo. You are participating in sports, clubs, organizations. Maybe you help bring the first TEDx talk to Union. You are studying abroad. And you probably have this normative discontent. And who is benefiting from this? You are not benefiting from this. I'm not benefiting from this. Companies that make money based on telling us we have flaws and then selling us a product to fix it. And companies that advertise their completely unrelated product with unhealthy, unrealistic appearance ideal models are profiting from this. So beauty, fashion, fitness, even alcohol pairs it with scantily clad young women. And we're, they are profiting from this normative discontent. And I want to ask how you're feeling right now, because I'm mad. I mentioned that I'm a clinical psychologist. I treat individuals with eating disorders. I see amazing, talented young men and women who look in the mirror and they think that they are fat and disgusting. And they believe that because of what they see that they're unworthy of love. And these eating disorders are costly. Stuhl Dreyer and colleagues estimate that a year's worth of inpatient treatment for anorexia nervosa 
a disorder that's characterized by decreasing your caloric intake to the point that you're underweight, that treatment for this disorder costs $37,000 to $134,000 a year. That represents 62 to 266% of the median annual income in the United States. And it's not just the financial costs alone. Renker and colleagues estimated that 70 to 90 hours a month are spent by mothers, fathers, and significant others taking care of their relatives with eating disorders. And it's not just these costs, but eating disorders are deadly. Anorexia nervosa has the highest mortality rate of any psychological disorder, killing about 5% of individuals with the diagnosis per decade. And it has a 50 times higher suicide rate than the suicide rate in the general population. So I'm angry, and I'm unspeakably sad. And I hope that you're feeling some of this as well. So you might be asking me, OK, why are you telling us all this depressing stuff? I'm trying to say, we can change this conversation. Often we feel very small and insignificant in the face of multi-billion dollar industries. But we have the power to speak with our wallets. Companies often say, well, we don't have responsibility. We use these unrealistic, unhealthy appearance ideals because they sell, because it works. If it stops working, they have to change. So put your money where your mouth is. Do not buy products where they have models who have been photoshopped to have slimmed waist and enlarged breasts and slimmed arms and slimmed legs for thigh gaps that should not exist in adult women where they've removed cellulite and stretch marks and wrinkles and moles and flyaways. Support companies where they use more diverse models in terms of body weight, size, shape, ability or disability, race, ethnicity, and age. Or, and this is a revolutionary idea, companies that don't actually even use models to advertise their products, if you can find them. And speak with your words. Write to the companies where, and let them know why you are not using their products, and that you will be telling your friends and family to do the same. We do actually have power. Um, I have a magazine where they actually removed advertising content because readers wrote and said, your articles are espousing content about being healthy and fit, and yet your advertising content is really promoting this unhealthy appearance ideal. So we have a voice, and we can change the conversation with our friends and family. So when my friends say, oh, it's so sinful of me to have this ice cream, my response is typically, I, you're right. It speaks directly to your moral character. <laughs> and when my friends say things like, do I look fat in this? I really want to ace this interview. My typical response is something like, and I thought they were interviewing you for your nursing skills. Now, meanwhile, you don't have to do it sarcastically like I might. Um, and change the conversation when you are interacting with children and adolescents. Be careful about what you say, not to judge others for their appearance, not to judge yourself for your appearance, and not to talk about foods like they are good or bad. And if you are at Union College, you can learn how to change the campus culture and the conversation around body image by participating in the Body Project. And if you value your experience in the Body Project doing a workshop, tell your friends to participate in the Body Project. And if you want to get involved as a campus leader, you can also train to be a peer leader who delivers Body Project workshops. And if workshops aren't your thing, you can move the bar forwards with research. The National Eating Disorder Association's Feeding Hope Fund granted me, um, provided me with a grant to examine whether or not Helping young women learn to look at their body and be grateful for what their body can do for them and what they can enjoy and experience, as opposed to valuing their body for an object. We were, we were looking to see whether or not this functionality appreciation approach, where we're valuing it for what it can do for us, helps reduce eating disorder risk factors. And in the future, we're hoping that if that's effective, that we can move it to an app-based format. So this is a TED Talk, Technology, Entertainment, and Design, and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about technology's role. The Pew Research Center 
finds that 85% of 18 to 29 year olds are at risk age for eating disorders, have smartphones. And three quarters of that age group uses their smartphones to look for information on health conditions. So if you look up body image on your smartphone, what you will find is pages and pages of filtering and retouching apps. And you will not find any evidence-based treatments for body image dissatisfaction. So we're very much hoping that if our pilot study, our self-image study is effective, that we can develop an app and then pilot that app to see if that might be a helpful way to reach more people and help them change their own internal body image conversation. And if you're interested in getting involved and you happen to have app development experience, come talk to me after this talk. All right, thank you very much.